hello everyone. My name is Andrea Campos and I um, said that I'm joined here with Mr. Brandon Lee. We are both graduate research assistants at UC Austin and we are very excited to kick off this open topic session and introduce with you or share to you our research titled Investigating the Interface Shear Resistance Through Slant Shear Test, a critical review of current science. So I'll first introduce some background information in our experimental program and then Brandon here will talk on the code evaluation and corresponding database analysis and our conclusions and ongoing work. So I would like to first off this, first start off the presentation with this statement. Cities are not static, they're growing. And as engineers, we are tasked with the responsibility of meeting those ever-growing demands. Um, our population only gets bigger and our existing structures have to meet this continuous growth. And whether it is expanding a bridge, adding a new structural system to an existing structure, cold joints are everywhere in growing cities. Now you may ask, what is a cold joint? A cold joint is the interface between two layers of concrete that were casted at different times. You see that here and here. Um, they can happen intentionally, such as in scenarios where we uh, retrofit or um, expand structure, or they can happen unintentionally um, in scenarios where we have unexpected delays in the construction phase. Um, in any case, the cold joints introduce a discontinuity in concrete that require additional design approaches. Um, in current design codes, they do not specify on how to design for these cold joints in disturbed regions. And in these disturbed regions, um, we have discontinuity that introduces a significant nonlinearity into the strain profile. And um, we do know, however, that a common design approach to design, design for these disturbed regions is by use of the strut and tie method. And so it becomes important to investigate um, the strength of strut crossing cold joints. And here we have the stress field and boundary conditions of a slant shear test that are very similar to that of a strut crossing a cold joint. And therefore it becomes, you know, the research that we're really presenting today is a series of slant shear tests that were performed and that serve as an initial step to our bigger research statement, which is investigating the strength of strut crossing cold joints. So here's our experimental program. Um, we have a test matrix that is structured based on prevalent variables found in the current literature. We have five different series, and in each series we have different groups that correspond to different alternatives of that said variable. And so we first start off with the first series. Uh, we investigate different cold joint inclinations of the plant shear specimen, where theta is measured from the vertical, and it's Good to mention that in these, each group, we fabricate three slant shear specimens. And for the second series, we investigate different levels of interface roughness. Um, for group M, these specimens are plastic monolithically, where there is no cold joint in these slant shear specimens. For group NR, it's shown right here, um, there is no intentional roughening in, on the cold joint interface. And for groups R1 and R2, they are roughened using um, R1 uses unidirectional stripes, and R2 is even more roughened with a grid-like pattern. And these, I guess you can say, stripes are positions are positions at 0 0.5 inches and are at a depth of 0 0.125 inches. For series three, we investigate um, different variations in the constant strength between the first layer, which is known as the substrate, and the overlay, which is the second layer. And for our general mixture, it's denoted as N. We have a concrete compressive strength of 2.7 KSI. And for um, the overlay, we tested two higher concrete strength mix mixes um, for, that are denoted as H1 and H2 and have a 3 and 3.8 KSI concrete. Concrete compressive strength. For series four, we tested um, different casting age differences, which, which is essentially the time duration between the substrate, casting of the substrate and casting of the overlay. And um, for the four hour time duration, we chose this to um, simulate the concrete placement delay. And for the 28 days and 56 days, 
we wanted to recreate scenarios of stage construction, repair, and retrofit. So finally, for the last series, we wanted to investigate different maximum aggregate sizes. Um, again, for our general mixture, we used a, which denoted as A1, um, for our substrate, we used a diameter of the coarse aggregate to be 5 8 inches. And for our overlay, um, we tested two different um, aggregate sizes. One, one being um, the substitution of the coarse aggregate for fan, fan aggregate. And um, for A3, we wanted to substitute the coarse aggregate with um, crushed concrete having a diameter of 3 8 inches. So here is the general procedure on how we fabricated these precious specimens while still including the variables I just presented. So we first start off with our cylinder molds attached to these wooden stands and this helps us achieve the full joint inclination of these sanctuary specimens. And we first cast the substrate um, to ASTM standards and we use this wooden gauge right here to ensure the cons consistency of the interfacial level of the substrate. And then we apply the intentional roughing to our substrate and finally we cast the overlay um, after the specified casting age time duration. And finally, all these plant shear specimens and the specimens used for material testing were subjected to the same curing conditions and at a time period of seven days. So finally, once we fabricate these plant shear specimens, we're ready to test them. So we tested these plant shear specimens by applying a uniaxial compression load at a constant displacement rate of 0 0.05 inches per minute using the 440 kib MTS load frame. Um, the boundary conditions were idealized by using a tilt saddle at the top and a roller at the bottom to, to allow for rotation and lateral displacement. And to ensure a uniform loading condition, we applied sulfur caps at the top and bottom of the um, sanctuary specimen to ensure a level contact surface. And we used the optical tracking system, also known as OptiCheck, to measure the um, spatial data of the target be able to quantify the slip at the cold joint. And um, these targets were placed along the cold joint in, um, interface, um, six being at the substrate and six in the overlay space at one inch increments. And so now we go back and um, to the bigger question, which is, um, well, how are, we, how are we going to evaluate the significance of these five variables um, to the capacity of the cold joint? And we do this by um, two things, one being the governing failure mechanism and two being the interface shear resistance. And so we categorize these failure mechanisms into three distinct modes based on the species and the characteristics of fracture. Um, the first, this, the first uh, failure mechanism is the slant shear failure, which is failure at the pole joint. And then we have your crushing of concrete. And finally, we have a hybrid failure, which is a combination of the slant shear failure and the crushing of concrete. So once we identify which specimens do fail in a slant shear failure, we can then calculate the interface shear resistance by taking the ultimate capacity. And we can divide this ultimate capacity into two force components, one being the normal force acting on the interface and the um, shear force acting along the interface, which is represented by the applied load times the cosine of theta cj. Again, theta cj being the angle measured from the vertical to the pole. The chart shows the average capacity of each group, and the color and uh, field patterns of green indicates the number of specimens fell through slant shear test out of three repetitives. With different inclinations, series one performed similar capacity. However, the governing failure mode switched from slant shear failure to crushing of concrete after the inclination reached 45 degrees. Series 2 highlighted the effect of interface roughness. For specimen without intentional roughening, group NR performed 28%, excuse me, 28% of decrease in capacity. Test results from group R1 and R2 indicate that the capacity was not uh, significantly affected by the roughening pattern. Failure of strength differential specimens uh, were mostly governed by crushing of concrete. During the experiments, crushing of weaker layer occurred earlier than the external load exceeding the interface shear resistance. 
interesting results were observed from Series 4. With only four hours of casting age difference, specimen with cold joint performed identical to specimen without cold joint. This indicates the existence of minimum time span to create a cold joint and form a weak link. By comparing the test results of group 28 and group 56, we can observe that the capacity increased with the time span. And this actually aligned with the founding from previous research. Finally, for specimen with different aggregate size and the overlay, specimen without coarse aggregate in the overlay, group A2, performed 38% of decrease in capacity. This indicates the effect of aggregate size and the need of future research to introduce this effect in current design specifications. Speaking of current design code, the, intense, uh, the interface shear resistance were calculated with five different design expressions based on their interface property and then compared with the test result. All expressions considered two factors when calculating the interface shear resistance, the coefficient of cohesion C and the coefficient of friction mu. These two factors were further determined by the amplitude of interface roughness. For interface of specimen in this research, roughened with stripes and grid of 0.125 inch amplitude was considered as roughened interface by FIB model code and neural code. However, ASHTO, ACI, and CSA required a larger amplitude to actually take into account of the contribution of interface roughness. Therefore, during the calculation, we were only allowed to use coefficients corresponding to non roughened interface. The estimation results from uh, FIB model code and Euro code performed great alignment with the test results by performing a V square error referred to as R square value of 0.9. Since ASHTO, ACI, and CSA consider the interface as non roughened interface, over conservative estimation were observed from um, the estimation results with the R square value equals to 0 0.84, 0 0.80, and 0 0.82 respectively. From the estimation result, it is obvious that the accuracy of estimation is improved when the interface roughness is considered. Therefore, for these three specifications that are currently neglecting the effect of interface roughness in our research, we use coefficients corresponding to roughened interface to recalculate the interface shear resistance. This results in a significant improvement in accuracy with a R square value around 0.96. However, Numerous unconservative cases indicates a need of modification. An innovative approach was proposed to obtain these two factors, coefficient of cohesion and coefficient of friction, uh, for an interface with intermediary roughening amplitude. For example, interface of specimen in this research roughened with amplitude of 0.125 inch was considered as non roughened interface by these three specifications. However, the test results clearly shows that the interface roughness increased and contributed to the interface shear resistance. Therefore, linear interpolated approach was proposed to obtain these two factors. And this approach actually better aligned with the natural physical behavior of friction, where coefficient of friction is a continuous function of interface roughness instead of governing by a specific threshold. The R square value uh, of the estimation from linear interpolated factor approach, also referred to as LIF approach, was significantly improved to 0.93 comparing to current design specifications. The unconservative cases observed from the LIF approach is significantly less than directly using coefficients corresponding to rough and interface. The LIF approach were later further validated with 124 slanture test results from previous experiments. Again, LIF approach performs a higher accuracy compared to current design code. Even though we observe some unconservative cases in a lower stress condition, we, we spoke about this before, the LIF approach focused on rough and interface, and therefore, the higher stress condition usually occur at the ultimate state. Conclusions. From the experimental result, the interface roughness and the aggregate size appear to be two most influential factors out of five key variables. However, 
failure mode switch from slanture failure to crushing of concrete simply by increasing the inclination. This indicates that the inclination still affects the cold joint behavior. The interface shear resistance were evaluated by current design code, and LIF approach was proposed to uh, and validated with experimental results from this research and previous experiment. The LIF approach shows significantly improvement in the accuracy of estimation with limited unconservative cases. Despite the hot weather we have in Texas, research and experiment relates to cold joint are in full swing. Hilarious. Large scale slanter column will be tested to investigate cold joint behavior with a larger interface. Full scale experiments with structural elements including beams and footings will be tested to investigate the cold joint behavior in a disturbed region. Finally, our ultimate goal is to develop design guidelines and modeling approach for cold joint and different kind of structural elements under various conditions. Before we end our presentation, we would like to address our appreciation toward Texas Department of Transportation by sponsoring our research. And we would like to thank Dr. Furky, Dr. Wong, Dr. Yu, and Dr. Bayrak for your support and guidance. The following is our contact information. Thank you guys for listening, and we certainly welcome a few questions.